cool. Welcome everyone. This is another fun new series or continuation of an old series of ours. Uh, if you've joined us for the first time, welcome. Uh, we're deep learning adventures, a fun community around data science and deep learning in general, with friends around the country and around the world as well. I'm joined by my great friends and colleagues and co-organizers Robert and David today and friends from all around the country. So welcome. If you're joining us from YouTube or other uh, social media channels, welcome and feel free to comment whatever channel you're using. Uh, we're using Slack internally for communication. I'll, and I'll share the link in a, in a minute here. Uh, or you can also comment on, on Meetup as well. So with that said, let me share my screen. And you can find us on, on Meetup, Deep Learning Adventures. Um, if you joined us in the past, you might remember that we had what we call this uh, Kaggle mini courses adventure. Uh, Kaggle is a data science platform where uh, you can explore data sets, you can build your own notebooks, you can uh, participate in competitions, um, and you can really uh, hone your skills in data science. And it's a really great community. And we also had the, some of the content developers and data scientists of Kaggle uh, giving us an interview a couple, uh, a while ago. Uh, so Kaggle actually released this cool um, new module. And I don't remember if when we were interviewing Ryan, but he was mentioning something about some new modules coming up. Uh, something on unsupervised learning and maybe time series. So this is one of them. So we're excited to present it to you today. And uh, we, we decided to break it into two parts because the content was super interesting and it was getting a little bit longer. So today we're gonna, we're gonna do part of it and the next we're gonna do the other part as well as some additional content as, as you'll see. Um, later on, we have some cool events which I'll share in the end, but yeah, so, so far um, this is the adventure. So. I'll share the link with you and uh, I'll stop sharing and I'll pass it to David. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So as George mentioned, uh, this is a um, <clears throat> whole course on time series. And here's the, it's made up of uh, six lessons here. Uh, we'll cover the first four today, which is, uh, I'll do the first two, which is linear regression with time series, uh, cover trends, and then Robert will go through seasonality and using a time series as features. Um, always a problem getting to the next tab. Go <laughs> down here. So let me know if this is a, Good size for everybody. The font is legible. Let me know if there's any any issues with anything like that. Um, yeah, that's great. Okay. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about is linear regression with time series. And if you're not familiar with time series, um, it's it's data that's sequentially in order based on some measurement of time. Uh, could be a measurement that's taken every day, every minute, every month, once a year, but there's a series in there and everything is, is stamped with a time. Um, and the most important use of time series is for forecasting the future for that data. Um, it's very, very popular in machine learning tasks. Um, and so Ryan goes through here some of the, the uses of it um, and what we hope to accomplish. Um, there are a couple of different uh, um, data sets we'll be using throughout this, but one of the most important is uh, a time series forecasting competition that used store sales. And if I recall right, yeah, it's right here. It's in Ecuador. It's in Ecuador. So it's a big uh, company there and they have a lot of different product categories and they track track that data. Um, so in general, here's an example of what a time series looks like. Uh, this would be for a bookstore that's uh, tracking their sales of hardcover books on a daily basis. Usually you have a data set where the index is the, the uh, time, or in this case, a date. And you may have various uh, other fields that are uh, measured 
on at each day. So here, for instance, hardcover, it could also be tracking like total store sales in dollars or uh, some other measure of units uh, or um, maybe the amount of inventory they have in stock each day. Many, many different things that a business might be interested in or you know some other uh, organization that the business might be tracking something different. Uh, maybe a hospital is interested in their collection of PPA so they can forecast when they need to order more, things like that. Um, and if there's a long period of ordering to get new hardcovers in or something, then they may want to they may want to be able to forecast this quite a way out in advance so that they will never run out of stock. Um, so what is what? How do we use linear regression? Well, linear regression is basically a uh, a collection of weights and biases where each feature, which is in this case they're only showing one feature, which is this hardcover but you could have many different rows here that could be different features. Um, each of them is multiplied by a calculated weight or a learned weight that the model, the linear regression model learns. And plus a bias, a bias is, is basically the uh, intercept. If you were to plot um, this function of target versus all these, you know, a single feature or something, you might wanna have it offset by a certain amount for every single value. Um, we'll see some examples of that here in a minute. It'll make it a lot more clear. Um, one of the most important things is when we look at data like this, we try to figure out, you know, what is our time step? Um, and that's, that's the difference between the time for each row in our data. Um, and, and it should be for the best use, it should be um, uh, a consistent frequency and we, see here it's every day but we don't always have that data and there's there's ways to uh to handle that type of uh, time series as well but right now we're just going to stick with time series that have consistent every every value is there no missing values so we can um we can introduce a new feature that we can engineer based on that that index of our time series so here we're, we're using the date, we're gonna introduce um, what we call a, a time dummy. Um, it's a time feature where we're basically just showing, you know, counting up the number of steps we have and, and labeling each one of them. And we'll show you how to produce that just a second in code. So now we have our hardcover, which is gonna be our target for prediction and time, which is gonna be our first feature that we're gonna use. And if we go back to our equations that we use when we're doing linear regression, time would, or sorry, target would be the hardcover value here. And our feature one would be that time column. And we would be able to now learn based on the data, a weight for that column and a bias for that, to get that target to produce these numbers. So again, um, here's, here's that, boiled down to the equation that we're going to use with just this time feature, this time dummy. And here's a plot of those hardcover sales over the course of 30 days and a linear um, fit of it. So you can see it's, you know, it's not exactly fitting every point, but it's a pretty good fit um, showing that this might be a linear model. Um, we can also introduce what are called lag features. It's another very popular way of uh, introducing features based into a time series. And that's basically done by shifting. Um, in this case, we're shifting by one time step. So the value that's in time zero is going to be placed into lag one. The value in time one is going to go into lag two. So you, this could be... Uh, you know, done on a weekly basis instead of just one day. It could be lag, you know, you can lag by whatever amount you want to, to make sense for the particular problem. Um, and then you can do a, just like before, you can use linear regression to do a, a calculation using this lag feature for, to, uh, to predict your target. And this is very, very common that, you know, that the sales on the next day have a relationship to the sales on the previous day. So that's kind of what you're, you're assuming when you do a lag here. Um, and here's a plot or a lag plot of hardcover 
um, sales, where again, we're now instead of just time, we're, we're calculating the lag um, and, and then a linear fit of it. Um, so lag features are what we call a serial dependence. Um, so the observation can be predicted from the current observation can be predicted from previous observations. And that's very common in many, many times, uh, time uh, series. Um, so the next thing we're gonna go through here is an example. And we're looking at a data set of uh, the number of vehicles passing through the Bereg tunnel in Switzerland. And the data covers from every day from November, 2003 to November, 2005. So two years worth of data. Um, and we're gonna apply linear regression to this. So here's an output of the first five uh, rows. And you can see that we've got every day as our index and the number of vehicles passing through the tunnel on that day. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna produce that time dummy. Um, and the way we do that is we can use a, a numpy uh, function called a range. And all you do is you give it the length of your data. In this case, the, they use the length of the index. So the tunnel down index is just the, the total number of rows you have. And it'll produce this feature that we're gonna call time, which is the time dummy. And if we print that out, we'll see that indeed that's what it does. It starts at zero and goes all the way to the end. Um, and we can fit this with our linear regression. And to do that, we're gonna import from sklearn. It's got a linear model package where um, linear regression is implemented as a model. We can, um, <clears throat> the only data we have right here is number of vehicles, which is gonna be our, our label or our target that we're gonna try to predict. And the only feature we have is this dummy time feature. So we'll extract that time feature into the X and our number of vehicles into our Y. So our features and our targets. Uh, the model is initialized and fit on those features and targets. And we're gonna store the, uh, the fitted values as a time series with the same time index um, as the training data. So we're gonna, we're gonna just see how well it did if it can predict that data that we just fit. So we'll call predict on it. We'll store that value in a series and the index that we use in the series is the same index that we have for X. It's going to be the, the dates. Um, so if you were to um, go and print the coefficients or the weight and the bias, the weight that it actually learns and models creates is 22.5 times the time feature plus the bias, which it appears about 98,000. And if we plot that over the course of the days in the data set, this is what we get. So we can see the fit here um, is right kind of in the middle linear, of course, because we're just plotting a, a linear function for the linear regression. Um, there is a way to uh, also do this with a lag feature. And so we'll try that next. Uh, Pandas, if you're not familiar, has a, a really easy function called shift where you can create a new, um, a new row based on the value of another column in the prior row. So here we're gonna just go back to that number of vehicles column. We're gonna shift it by one and that we're gonna call that our lag one. So the first one, we won't have a lag one calculated. So it puts in a, not a number because there was no value to shift in, the prior, in a prior row. Um, but you can see that the next one has the, the number of vehicles from the previous row and so on down, down the road. So we have to kind of decide what to do with this missing value. Um, you, can, you can fill them with zero, you can backfill. There's all types of approaches for imputing those values, but we can also drop that uh, first, first row we want. And that's what we're gonna do right here. We're gonna, we're gonna create our features, which in this case is just the lag one. We're not gonna use this time one. So we're just gonna use the lag one feature and we're gonna drop all rows where we don't have a value. Um, so we're gonna drop that first, first one and not use it for training. Um, and then we'll get our, our number of vehicles based on that. Sorry, the, the, the actual values here. I think there might be, well, there's not, there's not really a, 
you'll notice they don't go and try to drop the first one here. They take care of that here. When they do a line, they're going to drop the, the value in the target. So we don't have a, we lost this row right here because of that. And so we're not going to try to predict this value. So we're going to drop that as well. So now we've got our X and Y and X's, and we're going to, again, run linear regression against it. Um, we're going to print that out, and we're going to make our predictions based on uh, the model. And here is our lag plot of the tunnel traffic. So again, before we saw how the lag was scattered around the number of vehicles, um, I will take a quick moment to uh, go back and look at the plot before this. I don't know if you recall, I told you some about the bias it could be thought of as an intercept on an XY plot. So here it's 98,176. And that in fact is where we start at. It's very close here. It's 98, you know, 98,000. So just real close to 100,000 here. So we have pushed everything up by that amount. So that's our bias. Um, okay, so back to our tunnel flag plot. Here you can see it also has a bias that it's learned. Um, so, so here's the next thing he shows is a, a, a plot that shows how our forecast, oh, sorry, um, how, how it's going to correspond to the behavior in the series in the recent past. Um, So this is a, I forgot what it's showing here. I'm um, sorry. So I think you're showing the actual data in gray and black and in yeah. blue you're showing the trained data. So that's what your model was trained on. Right, okay. Kind of yeah, so it's showing. So the point is that the best models are going to um, use many, many different features, including, uh, you know, time dummies, time step features, and, and also lag features. Um, and then he wants to, we're going to go into the, uh, the exercise and I'll go through it. It's, it's very similar to what we do in the actual um, uh, tutorial here with just a few different examples, uh, changes. Um, do you mind if we pause here for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Question. Is there a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, Martin has a question here. Is there any data preparation that is needed specific to time series regression? Um, do we say it again? If there any data data preparation that's specific to time series, um, do we need to center scale? Is there any specific step we need to take for lagging, correlation, or other features? Well, I would say that's um, somewhat unique in the sense we'll, we'll see a lot of these um, type of lag type of things. But we'll also see a lot of averaging um, where you do a lot of work um, with what's called windowing, where, where you look at, okay, maybe across a week, you know, was, could we look at the weekly average of the number of vehicles going through the tunnel or things like that. So there's there's many different kinds of uh, feature engineering and this and in this course we'll go through some of those so you get an idea of some of the but that they are unique in the sense that you do kind of windowing and averaging and things that you don't normally do with um, you know this is all tabular data but you don't normally do that kind of stuff with tabular data um, a lot of times you're more interested in calculating like interaction of features um, in tabular data and, and here we're not as interested in that as we're more interested in how uh, things change over time. And um, so that, anybody, I don't know if you or Robert have another comment, but that would be a, how I would say it's different. I would say that one another major difference between time series and other tabular data is that now there's actually an ordering to the rows. That's right. And that has a couple of consequences. Um, one regarding how you will train, test, split your data. Uh, sometimes you have to be very careful about that to make sure that you're uh, doing a fair test and don't have leakage. Um, we're not going to go into that today. That, that may be something for next week. Yep. Uh, another consideration with time series, especially regards uh, pre-preparation, 
is that because of this relationship between the rows, you may want to do some quality control check to make sure that your time interval is consistent as you go down to make sure that you are not drawing conclusions that are wrong. If you, if you start with one time interval and it changes throughout, you, you just want to be aware of what's in your data. You might be a little bit more, more reason to ex, do exploratory analysis of data in right. advance. Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't know if we mentioned this, but when you train your data, when you split your data in training validation tests, you, you have to keep in mind the order of your data, right? You cannot just randomly shuffle them. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have some undesired data leakage or other phenomena. But yeah, that's another consideration that's different from structured data. Um, so some questions about autoregressive models. I think that's and how is that related to regression? Um, I don't think they're related per se, unless we use some kind of like a lag feature. Um, that's when I would consider that we're getting close to an autoregressive models when we're considering past values to predict the next values. Um, yeah, autoregressive, it's in the name, right? You are doing a regression on the series itself. Right. So, and specifically on past values of that series. Right. And there was another question here about uh, lags. Most of the time, I think this course, I'm not sure it goes beyond lag one at all, but there are plenty of situations where you might want second and third order and higher lags. Yeah. The further out you look, the more likely you're going to be confused by noise. And there are some statistical tests for that. Um, uh, I may mention that a little bit in the section that I, in the uh, fourth unit out of the six here tonight, but it's not a focus of this course. Okay. Uh, you know, the other thing I forgot is the, um, the basis of the techniques that are being taught here are, are based on uh, numerous Kaggle competitions that involve time series and how the winners went about it, some of the most interesting solutions they applied. But this is not the end all of approaches. There are, there are many other approaches to time series um, that aren't gonna be covered in this course, but this gives a great overview of it and, and some of the novel approaches that have worked for people. All right, if there's not anything else, I'll go into the exercises. Go for it, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, the exercise is very similar to what we just saw in the tutorial. Uh, it has to do first to start off with the bookstore again. Um, and they're looking again at store sales and average store sales. They're going to produce average sales here. And we're going to go down and um, look at a plot of those hardcover books that we saw before. Um, we're going to create the uh, they're going to talk about um, that that line that we just saw here is basically this this function here, uh, this linear function. Um, so, you know, over six days, they ask you over six days how much, on average, would you expect sales to change, and you can figure that out from this equation um, and uh, get the answer for that. Um, <clears throat> Then we're going to look at a, one with a lag feature. Um, here is shown um, again the uh, the first one has this equation using lag one. They calculated lag one. Um, the error is just what they call the bias here. But um, and the second one has a negative weight. They're using the same weight here um, and lag one and. When you look at the weights with lags, uh, one thing they do talk about is that when when the weight is close to one, it means that the next value of the target will likely have the same sign as the previous step. While when the weight is close to minus one, it means that the calculated targets will likely have the opposite sign to the prior value. Um, and so they ask you to figure out which one of these is the positive weight and which one's the negative weight. Um, remember the positive weight basically says that the value before it looks similar in sign, you know, where it is below or above or below zero, 
to the one before it, whereas the, the one with the negative weight is quickly going to be switching sign. So it's pretty clear that series two is going up and down really fast, between, you know, as, as the time series goes between the minus and plus values. I um, thought that was an interesting point. So the next thing that they asked us to do is actually fit a, a dummy time uh, feature. So as we recall in the, in, the, um, in the tutorial, we can create our time, dummy time with this uh, numpy function. And then we can make our prediction. Here we're predicting the, um, the average sales, which here is labeled as sales. And you just, again, get your linear model, fit it, and then make your predictions on that data. And that's just basically showing you how to do it. They plot that here. And again, this, uh, this is a linear, you know, regression linear fit of the actual data of hard of sales, average sales. Um, the next thing is they're gonna do lag one with the shift feature of a pandas data frame. So we're gonna create lag one and um, do, again, do a linear regression fit of that and show that. Um, I think they plot that as well. Here's that plot. For some reason, I can scroll down. Okay. I think that's the that's the end of the, the first exercise. Any questions on that? Very similar to this tutorial. So just to clarify, we're either using the time index or the lag, and we're only using one feature at a time here, right? We're not combining multiple features. No, we're using one. So the first time we use the um, the time, the dummy time, time index. Um, yeah right here, so we're using time, right? Mm -hmm. To do our aggression against that. And then this, this second time we're using just the lag. So, right. okay. Uh, sorry, right, right up here. So we're just using, these are our features, right? And that's our target. So later on, probably gonna see more complex models where you use multiple features. That's right, yep. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Any questions for David at this point, feel free to chat them. I see Robert and Dimitri and Chris are doing a great job answering them here. Oh, thank you. There, there's an interesting question in the chat about uh, NLP use cases, um, time series for NLP. I, I haven't really encountered this. Um, typically when you're doing, uh, and not even NLP, I think the question is more about speech to text. Uh, so audio to, to text. Oh. Um, Everything I've seen doing this is is just doing deep learning, um, right. not really engineering features, individual lags, but uh, just passing the whole series. Are you talking about like spectrograms and how you treat that as a time series instead of with other yeah. measures? Mm. Okay. Yeah, so that's one thing. Maybe some dig digital signal processing or something. To... Maybe an adventure is in order for speech <laughs> text. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Thanks, David. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next uh, chapter or course in this section, which is um, trends. And a trend is a, uh, a change in a feature over um, a time, like an average amount of time. So um, it's, a, it's persistent, it's long-term, it, and it, it's usually, usually done with the average or mean um, sometimes you look at other um, statistical measures, but here's here's just some example um, of where you can see uh, trends. I guess the first one is the motorcycle sales in the, in the Netherlands can, seems to be having over the course of each decade, each year, uh, an uptrend um, in terms of stock. So this is how much how many they have. Um, the Earth's rotation is trending uh, up here in terms of the day's length are getting longer over the long term. Um, this is over 150 years or something like that. Um, and this is in a very small amount. This is you know 10 to the minus five seconds. So it's pretty small. Uh, marathon times, they don't say what marathon, but I guess in general, 
maybe it's an average or maybe it's like the New York City Marathon or something. Uh, marathon times since the turn of the century, turn of last century, sorry, are, um, are decreasing quite a lot in terms of minutes, pushing up very close now to the, to the two hour mark. Um, in fact, I think it's been broken, right? <clears throat> but this is average times. Um, I assume this is the average winning time because if I was running, my time wouldn't change that much. <laughs> um, and then the last one they look at is the cement production in Australia in terms of millions of tons of cement. And uh, here we go. This is uh, looking across many years, each quarter. So how do we how do we find out if our data, our time series data, has trends? Well, one thing we can look at it is a moving average plot, and here's a great uh, visual of that. Um, looking at the amount of CO2 um, carbon dioxide released by the Mauna Loa um, um, volcano, which I believe that's the one in Hawaii. I can't remember actually. Um, but what they're plotting here, the blue line is the moving average. Um, I can't remember if they tell us how many. Okay, so they're using a window size of 12. So the red dots are 12 measurements and <clears throat> the blue line is the average of those 12 dot, red dots. And so they're showing how it's plotted as we go along. They're doing it dynamically. And if you'll notice, the moving average is always in the middle of those red dots. They've centered it in this case. It doesn't have to be centered. You could, you could have it more delayed or more in advance, but it'll always be um, in the middle there. So they're taking the six red dots before that and the six red dots ahead of it and plotting the blue uh, what would be a blue dot actually, but they're, you know, they're showing as a continuous line or a curve. Um, but you can see how it kind of stays in the middle there and, and it's following the trend. Now you see you have a trend going up with the cyclical um, piece of data there. They're plotting here. You can very clearly see what a moving average that the trend is, is going upwards um, in the CO2 released over the course of uh, over a decade. So, you know, about um, so how do we how do we actually do feature engineering to to get a trend? Um, so if it was a linear trend, we can just use the linear you know model and it'll 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 already take care of that. But if this has not such a linear feature, maybe it's it's more curved or some other different kind of a trend, we're going to have to use higher order functions. So something more like a, um, you know, something that's quadratic or something. We need to add something like now we're going to take our feature and square it, and we want our, you know, linear regression to be able to learn that. So we've got to, we've got to, got to have, going to have to give it these values. Um, so here's an example of like a linear trend versus um, a quadratic trend, and you know, the car sold in Quebec is, is going up on a regular basis. Um, the trend is long, long standing and, and very consistent. Uh, production plastic, uh, yeah, production of plastic in Australia is also trending, but it actually trended down with somewhere around 1991, maybe 1990, maybe, you know, July of 1990 or so, uh, reached a low point and then is now trending back up in by 1995. So here we've got, again, a very long standing, uh, consistent trend ongoing, but its actual shape is different than linear. So we need to take care of that. Um, so the first example we're gonna go through is again, that tunnel data. And we're gonna use a nice feature of pandas, um, a data frame you can do, a, you can create a new um, feature called a moving average by, by uh, using the rolling method. Um, rolling is a nice way to do kind of what we call windowing uh, calculations, um, computing, and we're going to compute that uh, average. So we're going to do the mean here 
you could do something else like standard deviation or the max or min or you know lots of different things you could you could apply but the rolling gives you that window and and everything so here for the tunnel we want to track this over uh the year so 365 days we're going to look at the average across 365 days and again like we saw in that that animated plot we're gonna we're gonna do this at the center so you know we're gonna choose here also the minimum periods they always use about uh half the window size for this um, there's other options to rolling. If, if you're interested, you could track that down. It's you know well documented. Um, once we get this this rolling window, we're gonna we're gonna calculate the uh, the average. So what this does is we step through our time series. It pulls 365 of those rows, those data points, those features, um, and we're in the center, and we're gonna we're gonna plot the mean of those. Um, and then here we're gonna plot it onto the graph, and again. The rolling average is the uh, sorry. The moving average here is the blue line, and you can see it's it's different in the sense that it could be um, you know it could be a linear function to do this, but it's very interesting to do it in terms of an average. And now you see a very distinct trend upward in the tunnel traffic through the tunnel in uh, Switzerland. I think it was. Um, there's another way to uh, calculate trends if you don't want to do this this type of work with pandas and using rolling. Um, if you want to do it a quicker way, there's a there's a library in stats model um, called deterministic process. Um, deterministic means you know it's 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 very uh, it's not it's not random. It's determined, right? It's 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 not arbitrary. So um, obviously a trend we wouldn't want be random, we want to be consistent. Um, what this brings to us though, is not only its simplicity, but it uh, also brings uh, some uh, error handling capability. So um, maybe you have you know, problems with uh, your time series, sometimes at the edges in different places have failure cases for, for trying to calculate averages. So um, this, this library uh, can avoid some of those and has some built-in functionality. Um, there is uh, multiple arguments. You give it the index, which is what what is the you know the data, the dates, or the minutes, or whatever your your data is built off of. In this case, it's just the index of the tunnel, which you call as each day. Um, you give it the constant equals true, which says, do I want to include a bias in here? And in this case, we do. Um, and one important thing is order. Um, order tells it whether to look for um, a trend that's linear or quadratic or cubic or even higher number of polynomials are available. And then drop through. Um, sometimes you have multiple features that are um, can be collinear, um, meaning they have the same relationship to your target. And that for a lot of models that can be very confusing and it's better to drop out those uh, collinear features and you'll get a much better result. Um, we could do a quite a big, big study on why, why you want to avoid collinearity. Um, and then this deterministic process that we get um, object has this in sample method. Um, and what this does is it creates the features for the dates given in the index. Item. So in our data, we'll get those features and here x dot head. And what we get is for every day, we get our uh, constant and our trend. Um, the constant here is, is the bias basically, um, and then our trend. So we can see how we use this. Um, we're gonna do again, a linear regression on this. We're gonna use the target as the number of vehicles. Um, the one thing we do different here is we say fit intercept. We don't want to do that. Um, so we're already using the constant feature that the deterministic process calculated for us. So we're not really interested in trying to fit the intercept. It's already, already done. And we're going to fit this X, which you recall was what came out of our in sample method that we applied. And so here, when we fit this, we're gonna do the prediction 
just like we did before. And here's the tunnel traffic, a very linear trend, no surprise. We had, we had given it order equals one when we looked at producing the trend. And uh, so the great thing here is that they show you now how to forecast future uh, values in the trend. Um, so if I want to know what's going to happen in November, and you know, such I can do 30 days out, the 30 day forecast. And I do that using this, uh, the same deterministic function. It has this out of sample steps and it will, uh, it'll actually produce a, a new set of features. So it'll produce a, uh, a constant and a trend value for days out into the future, um, 30 days actually in this case. Um, and then we can use that with our model that we just trained on the prior set of training data to give us a uh, prediction and we can plot that in this Y4. And here we can look at it, it's giving, you know, the value, number of cars for future dates. Um, and if we plot that here, the, the blue line is our trend line for the data set that we had for the training data we had. And then the red line is our forecasted data for the trend. And you can see it's a very linear, of course it's linear because we have a very linear model. Um, so he mentions here that um, these simplistic models, they may seem, you know, linear regression might seem very simple, but they can act as a very good baseline for you and you can improve your model based from there. Um, but they also, work really well as a um, kind of like a ensemble model where you might combine them with um, something like XGBoost or Random Forest, which are, are not very good at uh, learning trends on their own. Um, so we'll learn more about that in lesson five later on. Any questions about any of this before I go to the exercise? Uh, can I clarify that fit intercept faults? Uh, is it because linear regression also has a constant bias and our time series has a constant bias. So I think that's, that's- You're talking about this fit intercept equals false? Yeah. Yeah. Right, so there's no point to have two constant biases. Um, yeah, it would be interesting like- Collinear basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two biases. Are called, yeah. Okay. Now, now you got to do some weird things too, right? Because if your, <laughs> your bias is now well, you know, it's got to do some weird things to try to figure out what the bias is. And right. Essentially, you want it to get to zero. Almost. But if you use another model that didn't have a bias, you would have left the, the deterministic process bias in it, I guess. Yes. Well, fit intercept false is, is right. That's just telling the model that you don't want a bias at all. So you're giving it one fewer parameter to fit. One right. less parameter to fit. Right. Because normally it would try to fit the bias and if you're telling it, well, we've already, we've already done that. <laughs> Essentially, so that's that's a decision that you might make if you if you know something about your data where you expect it should go through zero. And the other thing is to kind of remember we're fitting the trend right. We weren't fitting the actual, you know, any time any time values. We're just fitting. So so anything we can forecast here is the trend. We can't forecast for the individual number of cars for every day. So, um, so the exercise is a good one. We'll go to that if there's nothing else. Um, again, we're gonna load in the data um, for the uh, sales at the Ecuadorian place. And we're gonna look at food sales and auto sales and uh, the store sales of those. So, so we go through and uh, here we're looking at the food and beverage sales for each month during these years um, in the total dollars. Um, the, I was trying to think of the, so we're gonna start with doing the moving average method and use rolling from um, pandas. And we're gonna look at a window of 12, I believe it's days. Um, yeah, it's days, yeah. So for every day, so for 12 days, we're gonna use a moving average of 12 days. We're gonna put it, our moving average is gonna be in the center of those 12. And um, 
we always choose half for minimum period here. And we're gonna do the average. So we're doing a, a moving average. Um, so when we do that and we plot that out, here's the moving average for that same data. And it's not quite linear. There's uh, definitely a little bit of a turn here. Um, so let's think about the trend. Um, it says what order polynomial trend might be in there. Um, so they want us to guess, is it, you know, order one linear, is it two quadratic, is it three cubic or whatever. And when we, when we look at it, you can kind of tell it's, it's got a little bit of a curve in it. So I, I would say two, and that's what they're, they're saying. It's got a quadratic feature to it. Um, so then we're gonna do uh, average sales on a yearly basis. So we're gonna do a moving average across 365 days and plot that. So here is um, the data, of course, is day, daily or whatever, but the trend is more on a 365 yearly average. And here, here we see the, the trend line is not quite, it's, it's a little straighter, right? So if I was to guess, I would say this is you know, order, order one is a good fit. Um, so let's use our deterministic process from Staff's library to uh, create a trend feature. Um, and in this case, we're gonna do a cubic trend model and we're gonna do it for uh, a 90 days forecast. Uh, we're looking at the average sales data again. Um, so we're gonna look at that for an index. Um, it's interesting, I, I was looking into the model, the stats, things that it allows and there's a there's a concept called period and maybe Robert took a deep dive and can in the next section can tell us more about this but it's automatically calculated if you don't give them to a based on a frequency that it reads from the index if available or you can put it in there as a as an integer um, I just for fun put it in there as 365 I also put it in as different values it didn't seem to matter for this problem I think it might come more in effect with some of the work that Robert's going to show. Um, this case, we don't want to introduce the bias into this. So we're going to say constant equals, uh, we're not going to have constant equals true. It's going to be not in there. And um, we said we wanted to do a cubic uh, trend. So we're, we're going to do order equals three. And we're going to drop out any uh, of the uh, problem. So here's we're going to do that in sample method again to get our features and to get a forecast for 90 days. Uh, despite what they have here, there's a there's an error in the in their guidance here. It's a 16 days. Uh, they wanted 90 day forecast. So I just I put a note here that it should say 90 here, and that's what I used in my in my value to get the, the features for the feature. Um, so when we want to model this, we'll use linear regression on that X and Y. Uh, we also have the ability to predict uh, off of our, our X so we can plot how our trend looks on our training data, as well as predict the future. So here's our Y4 for that. And then we'll plot both of those. And so this is the cubic uh, trend. And you can see it's a very good fit for this uh, particular set of data and a nice future uh, trend line for it. So trend forecast, sorry. Obviously it doesn't catch all these nuances, especially in looks like 2014, there was a lot of this kind of general up and down. It, you know, the trend, trend is much larger. It's a yearly, it's 365 day based trend. So we're not gonna get this, these smaller, it might be interesting to go back and do a 30 day and see if you capture some of that. Um, so they talk about that in the next thing that if you were trying to calculate something like a more, you know, uh, complicated trend, you could use a higher order polynomial than just a qubit. Um, and you will get a much better fit. So for example, right here, they're gonna use a polynomial order of 11. Um, so here they've used order equals 11 and they go ahead and, and fit this. Um, 
And you can see they did a little bit better. You got, you got this nice little kind of rise here, which fit pretty well. Um, it does fall off at the end. I wouldn't pay too much attention to that, but um, it does capture some of the trend in the data. It's, it's questionable, but there is, a, there is a risk and they warn you about that, which is that when you use a really high order polynomial like this, um, they're very poor at doing forecasting. So one thing you have to ask yourself is what, you know, the whole point of studying a time series uses to do forecasting. So you gotta be really wary about, uh, you know, fitting a trend with a really high order polynomial. So when we used 11, for instance, um, you can see what happens with our forecast. You remember at the end, it was just falling off and well, it continued. <laughs> so that's their warning. Um, there is an option for these kind of complex uh, types of uh, trends is to use, uh, instead of polynomials, you can use splines and they don't, they don't go into what that is here. And I didn't, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on it, but uh, they have an optional part of this exercise where they show how you could do this. Um, they're going to use a, a method or sorry, yeah, a function called earth, which uh, allows you to calculate splines. And um, when they do that, now you can see we're getting all that very complex trending behavior that I was talking about before in the data. Um, and then the last thing they talk about, um, oops, sorry, is what, what's known as a, um, detrending. De um, they don't talk much about it here, um, but what they try to do is uh, isolate other patterns in the time series by detrending. Um, so we're going to try to remove that trend from our, our sales. Um, we're going to calculate an average sales. So we got our average sales is our Y. And then we predicted the trend for that same data with, with a spline. So this is the spline and we're gonna remove it. We're gonna subtract out that trend from the data. And then when we plot that, we should now see a much smoother, uh, you know, um, data with no trend in it. It stays consistently right here on the, around the zero. And so we've taken out the, uh, the trending and that can make somewhat the forecasting, it makes the forecasting on a different different level, right? So you are you would have to add back the trend if you wanted the real value. But if you're looking for some kind of patterns or, or different things um, in your historical data, uh, removing different trends can, can benefit you to see, see other patterns that are there that you might find useful for your future forecasting. So that's kind of the use of the trending. Um, any questions? I can't see the chat, so I don't know. Just in general discussion in the chat about overfitting and high order polynomials. Yeah, so yeah, that seemed like it was overfitting and definitely not forecasting properly. Uh, well, so here's a question. When would you then not use the spline method if, you know, because I mean, couldn't you smooth out the spline method if you didn't want it as granular rather than the polynomial fit? you did before, right? That's a, that's a good question. They don't give much uh, guidance on that either. Um, I, think, I think it depends on the data you're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you saw some of the other data like the, uh, the bookstore data, the, the tunnel data was well fitted with polynomial approaches. Um, whereas the sales in this uh, big superstore in, in Ecuador weren't necessarily well well fitted with those trends and uh, um, you probably can use splines to get a much better result. So it depends on you know how complex the trends are you're looking at is, is it would be my approach. I think it look I mean it, it looks like once you're getting above an order of three, 
you know, you start to have to be very careful. There's a question. How do we know, uh, by Neil, if the trend is a good trend? Like we haven't defined any metrics. Maybe we can take like the residuals, like the difference of the time series and the trend and look at the magnitude of those residuals or something else. Um, yeah, he, he doesn't show it here, but, um, you know, you probably want to do your evaluation of, uh, you're looking at historical data and you've, You've got a trend and you're, you're trying to fit it, right? So, you know, just like any other kind of machine learning, we would, we would often split the data, um, being very careful to preserve the, the, the time series nature of this so that we don't have any leakage. Yeah. But um, we would often split the data and do part of, use part of the historical data for training and part of the for, for evaluation of our our model's ability to predict before we had any confidence that we could predict the trend in the future. Um, does that kind of, does that answer the question? You're... Yeah, and also like Dimitri is saying, like the residuals should be close to like a normal distribution. Yeah. Ted made a comment about the splines. You're basically using piecewise linear splines. That's what you're doing. You're, you're doing piecewise fitting of the trend. You can also use cubic splines, which have like a smoother um, behavior. Uh, I would note that in these time series that we're looking at, they're uh, highly, uh, I think what you'd call heteroscedastic, like the the uh, variance changes a lot as you move along the time series. So in some cases the peaks and valleys are high and in other places the peaks and valleys are low. So it's going to be very difficult to get normally distributed errors here. Mm -hmm. um, but you, you can certainly look at that and you can also still try to minimize things like uh, mean squared error. Yeah. And just see what fraction of your variance is explained by the trend itself. Yeah. So there's a question. And at some point, we certainly know that there are other ways beyond trends, such as we'll see in the next few sections. That's right. To, uh, to do to do better. So, question is, why do you use the trending? Is that part of your like exploratory, exploratory data analysis, or are you actually trying to investigate your time series further? So, so if you look at this detrended value right now, you can see there, if there were other patterns that the trend was sort of, you know. Um, overwhelming, you couldn't, you couldn't see them or visualize them very well or actually calculate them. Now you might have that ability um, to do that a little easier when you detrended it. Right. So that, that would be another way to produce new features, you know, if you saw this, something else you could do. So you know there's a trend, you know that's a signal in your time series, you want to remove it. So you want to look for like secondary effects or secondary phenomena happening within your time series. So that's right. how I'd consider it. Like as you can see here, the minimum, the range of the time series increases over time, for example. You might not have been able to pick that up in the original time series. So if you see the min and the max values here are increasing, uh, or maybe some, some cycles as we're going to see later, or some periodicity, that might not be as easy to, to see in the trended time series. Mm -hmm. C by C, I mean like with your you know, as humans, or we can actually use algorithms. Like if you run an algorithm here, it might be, you might be able to pick up more patterns than in the trended one, making it easier for the algorithm to pick up patterns. Cool. Thanks everyone, great questions. Thank you, David. Uh, okay, I'll stop sharing and Robert, take the next part. <clears throat> Uh, hi, can you see my screen? Screen size okay? Uh, yes. Yes. Awesome. So we have learned about using trends to forecast a time series going forward, but often we know things about the time series that we're looking at. 
We may know that it has regular patterns. We may know that there's relationships between successive measurements. And we need other techniques for finding those behaviors within a time series. So the, the third section in this course introduces the concept of seasonality. And here they're talking about seasonality only in the sense of regular and periodic change. So in the sense of a very predictable, regular variation in the series. Four time series are shown here as examples. We have electricity demand. Uh, it looks to me like there are a... So you can think to yourself as you're looking at these time series, what are the seasonalities that we're seeing here? Electricity, you're seeing a combination, I would say, of daily and weekly seasonality. The daily is this uh, high and low values here. And presumably, since we're looking at uh, July in, I don't even know if they give a location, but probably somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere where you're using electricity, um, uh, air conditioning rather, uh, you may have more electricity demand in the late afternoon. And then at night, early morning, it probably goes down. However, you know that there's probably an annual seasonality too here that you can't even see in this figure because you're only looking at the summer. We have Seattle temperatures over here. Now we're looking at a period of many years, so we can see the annual seasonality. And you really can't see much of any other seasonality. There's, there's some daily seasonality built into there too, but it's just too small to see. Similarly, we have lift rides in New York City. This might be a combination of weekly, daily seasonality. Maybe there are some other longer term effects in there as well. And the final chart here, Dutch retail sales, is just showing that even when you have something that is dominated by trend, there may still be seasonality within that. So the sales may be increasing quite a bit here, and you can model it pretty well with trend, but you can do better if you're considering seasonality, um, guessing that maybe these spikes have to do with the holiday season and gift shopping. So how do you model seasonality in your time series? First thing that you should always do is take a look at it and see what, uh, what your data looks like. Seasonal plots are a nice way to do that. I wasn't aware of this terminology for it, but uh, essentially the idea here is you're just going to wrap around your time series. So you're looking at it uh, with the same phase of your expected season wrapping around on each other. So in this case, we are looking for weekly seasonality. So we are going to plot by day of week so that all the Mondays appear here on the left and all the Sundays appear here on the right. And we can get a much better idea of what that seasonal behavior or what that weekly behavior is like when we look at a figure like this. You, you can get an idea not only for the overall mean, for instance, week, uh, the views, what are we looking at? There's so many data sets used here, it's hard to remember which is which. Uh, this is Wikipedia's article on trigonometry, the article's daily views. So viewed more often, middle, middle of the week. Um, for some reason, there are fewer people checking out trigonometry articles on Saturdays. I don't know. Seasonal indicators are one way of trying to build a model from data where you're looking for this kind of seasonality. And we are going to build dummy features here that one hot encode the day of the week. So we have six of them. We don't need Monday because we'll have collinearity issues if we include it. And we're going to be looking at linear models exclusively here we will have these indicator variables, one for each of the other days. And now what we can do is we can look at this mean line here. And the dark uh, bold line is the average over all of this data. And this equation looks a little bit ugly here, but all it really means is the first 
Each of these is an indicator variable, so no more than one of them can be one at a time. So the first number here is how many views you expect on Monday. And then if you're a Tuesday, add 91 to that. If you're a Friday, subtract 261 from the Monday value. If you're Saturday, subtract 546, etc. The next thing that we come to here in this notebook is the Fourier features and the periodogram. So you can imagine that the indicator variables are very useful for weekly seasonality. They can be useful. They're not the only way you can do it. But the indicator variables could become very cumbersome if you're looking for a longer period. Suppose you're looking at days of the year instead of days of the week. Now we have 365 days. Do we really want 365 indi 364 indicator variables? Chances are we probably don't want to do that. So if we're now looking at the annual seasonality in the same Wikipedia trigonometry article access series. So this, this data I found a little bit interesting. So the smallest value here seems to occur around the winter holidays. I guess that's not surprising. There's also a lull, fewer people searching trigonometry in the middle of the summer. Uh, this lull here around mid-April, I, I don't, I don't know what to, why that would, why that would be in there. Perhaps there are school systems on calendars that, that I'm not familiar with, or maybe uh, trigonometry searches are down during tax season because people don't tend to need trig to do their taxes. It's, it's spring break, I think. Oh, or that could be. <laughs> So, so what are these Fourier features and how can we use them to build, to engineer features that a machine learning model such as linear regression could use? Fourier features are where you represent a function that is believed to be periodic with functions that are known to be periodic. And there's a nice mathematical property of Fourier series sine and cosine. Here's an individual sine or sine and cosine curve here over one period. And what you can do if you want to make sure that they return to the same values at the end so that you've gotten a full period, um, you, you have this frequency, but you can also add uh, any integer multiple of that frequency and you'll always return to the same values at the end. And what you what you will learn if you uh, study a, a, a certain bit of math or electrical engineering is that any periodic function can actually be represented as a linear combination of functions like this. So you could start with a DC value, a constant value, and then add uh, a sine of one times your period, cosine of one times your uh, uh, one times your, uh, yeah, time axis, and then double the f double the frequency of the sine, double the frequency of the cosine. You can, for really complicated functions, you may need to add uh, super high frequency terms in here, but any periodic function can be represented in this fashion. The seasonality that we seek to accommodate here is actually pretty simple. It, it may look complicated here because we have all this squiggliness up and down, but that is the weekly and daily seasonality that we can find in other ways. We expect that there is th this weekly and daily seasonality, but also a very smooth annual seasonality that might not need a terribly complicated function to fit. So we might be able to do that with only a small number of these Fourier pairs. This is a visualization they show here. Yeah, and they've actually shown uh, estimated fit for the annual seasonality. So you're just really looking for the uh, low frequency, very slow variation that you can model on top of the weekly and daily seasonality. 
those of you who have been with us for a while may remember that we did a meetup a while back on forecasting the uh, weather in Madrid. And a number of us tried different approaches to it. And, and one of the themes of the night was uh, you know, whether the uh, throwing lots of computational power at a weather prediction task could outperform simple approaches like the Fourier components analysis. The idea here being that weather would uh, be a pretty slow varying thing throughout the year and you might be able to represent it with a very small number of Fourier components. Uh, I believe uh, I, I was the one who took on the task of trying to do it with the Fourier method and I, I think I, I used only about six features and got results that were not, not too much worse I think than the and the deep learning approaches on the same data set. That was a humbling meetup for deep learning. <laughs> yes, but important to keep in mind. So sometimes the simpler approaches are, are useful. So the heat run does go down into that here in the text. Notice that we only needed eight features to get a good estimate of the annual seasonality. Another visualization that can be really useful for looking at and analyzing and determining the periodicity within your data is to look at a periodogram. And I'm not sure I've ever heard this word said in English. I don't know what syllable the accent there. Periodogram, periodogram, periodogram. If anybody uh, has great insight into that, please let me know. How many Fourier pairs should we actually include? So we're going to answer this question here by looking at this thing and I'm not going to go into the math here. I will show there's, I think there's an article here on periodogram coined by Arthur Shuster in 1898. Uh, it's essentially a fast Fourier transform, which is a generalized version of Fourier series when you don't necessarily know the period. Similar concept, just looking for periodicity in the data. And what we find here, you're looking at a power spectrum of the data. So you're actually getting a variance. The unit out is variance. It's a square of whatever the data was. And for wiki trigonometry, it looks like the strongest seasonality is probably the weekly seasonality. This <clears throat> semi-weekly here is a harmonic of the weekly. And you'll see these annuals and a few harmonics up here as well. Maybe some interesting stuff going on here to give you the full structure of that annual shape. And Ryan observes that the periodogram drops off after quarterly, four times a year. So he chose four Fourier pairs to model this in his linear regression at the bottom of this notebook. Now, after seeing all that, we finally get shown some of the code. And this is a way to generate these Fourier features. This is the uh, build it yourself way. It turns out that the deterministic process tool that David showed us last unit has a built-in method to make this really easy. Those of you who were with us earlier this spring may remember uh, the notebook that I presented on Capital Bike Share, where I was attempting to model the ridership in Washington, D.C.'s bike share system. That was an event that we presented a couple of times, but uh, at, the second, at the second meetup, uh, Kathleen and I presented some, uh, some material on on that and, and one of the things that, that I looked at here was Fourier features and I had not actually seen the deterministic process method at the time so I, th I think I did go through and build it just just like this simple way but I was using them with a deep learning model so there was no need to really consider higher order terms with a linear regression model you're going to want to be somewhat smart about where you cut off We're going to apply these techniques to the tunnel traffic 
and that was the Switzerland tunnel traffic that David showed us. So the few a couple of helper functions in here, we've actually seen the results of them already. One of them is this uh, seasonal plot, the one that produces that uh, that plot showing how the functions with the wrapping on top of each other. And another utility here for plotting the periodogram. And then we're going to read the data, parse dates by day, set that as the index, and convert it to a regular time series in pandas uh, with this, I think this is somewhat new functionality. I don't, I don't think this was in version zero of pandas. Robert, I just want to clarify the periodogram. It, it doesn't just apply to days, right? You could have a time series that was minutes or hours and it would still be useful. I think I've seen it before, right? Yes, there's, what you wanna do is make sure before you compute such a thing that your time intervals are regular because otherwise you'll, you'll get confusing and probably wrong results. Right. But as long as they are regular, it can detect signals down to the Nyquist frequency of the data. So as so roughly uh, you know, two periods. This one here, I think we had daily with the, the data were daily. So that's why we see that it cuts off here at um, a period of, I don't know what you would call it, but uh, um, basically three and a half times this period, right? It's, it's where the period is two days is when it would cut off because that's the highest frequency it can detect. We are going to look at the tunnel data here and we're plotting, let's see, we're making two subplots. We're going to look at the number of vehicles over a week and a year. So we're looking at two seasonal plots here to get a sense of what the seasonal variation is. Weekly, what is the dependence by day of the week? And what is the dependence by day of the year? We have many, many weeks that wrap over each other, of course, and we only have two years worth of data. So for most of this, we only see two different lines on top of each other, showing that weekly seasonality with these spikes. Periodogram, no, uh, no real surprises here. Weekly seasonality, couple of harmonics, the uh, double the frequency, three times the frequency. Uh, annual seasonality with uh, several harmonics as well. So he's deciding to use 10 Fourier pairs for the annual seasonality as a result of looking at this figure where it looks like it ceases to become meaningful to include these, these features in here. So you want to capture this behavior, and you're going to want the weekly behavior. We're going to go back and use the deterministic process again from stats models. And we also have, I believe the calendar Fourier is a new function introduced in this unit, unit three. And what that's going to do is generate our Fourier series data for us. So instead of having to build it by hand with the calculating sines and cosines, all we need to do here is tell it, I want order 10, which is going to give me 20 sine and cosine functions, 10 sines and 10 cosines, over annual seasonality, represented by the A here. And all you have to do is drop that in in this argument, additional terms, for you. So on the previous... On the previous unit, David mentioned that there was another argument in here called period, and he was playing around with it and saw that it didn't seem to do much when you're only looking at trend. 
and that is a function that a number that you can set to determine the uh, seasonality of the seasonal argument of the model. I found this to be a little bit confusing the way the deterministic process works here, but you have multiple types of seasonality that you can model simultaneously. I believe you could if you wanted to do, suppose you had an annual seasonality, but you also had some third um, seasonality that you wanted to capture somehow. Suppose there was some event that occurred once every um, you know, 2.63 years or something, something odd like that. I, I think you could build another calendar Fourier, create Fourier terms for it, and then drop that in additional terms as well. All this function is doing is creating additional columns for your ML model to ingest. The seasonal here, though, getting back to what I found confusing, is that is going to depend on the period argument, which you'll see that we haven't defined here. And I found the documentation a little bit confusing here and, and couldn't actually track this down, but it does look like if you don't provide an argument, it appears to default to weekly even though I couldn't find anything in the documentation confirming that. Does that have anything to do with the periodogram that the fact that the weekly had the highest power or is it just by default it's weekly? Well, yeah, that's, that's actually a good question. Yeah, I wasn't a super big fan of the documentation on the deterministic process either. Uh, the, there, was, uh, there was something, there was some process in the documentation that was where it was trying to estimate something if you didn't give it a value. Oh, I see. And I don't recall if it was this. I got the impression that the weekly thing was a default if you didn't give it a value. Right. So you're saying this code here is similar to say, setting seasonal equals false and then adding another calendar for you for the with frequency equals weekly. The difference is that here you're getting indicators, whereas with the other one you're not. So I didn't look into whether it's possible to have more than one indicator variable, mm -hmm. right? Once you've, once you've indicate, once you've used this one as the indicator variable, then you're stuck using the, another method here. You may be able to define another indicator variable and throw it in additional terms. This is just a convenience function here for, to use one indicator variable. What we're going to be doing here is doing the indicators for weekly seasonality day of week and day of year will be measured, will be modeled with the annual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit confusing. We're also going to have just an order one trend and a we will include a bias term. With that done, this is what our model produces now you can see a couple of interesting things. One is obviously we are starting to capture some of this variation. This may not be the best time range to view in order to see that because everything's squeezed together a little bit too much. Another thing that, that can clearly be seen is that we are able to forecast and we know something about the weekly seasonality in that forecast. Not only the weekly seasonality, this up and down stuff, but we also have some information about the annual seasonality as well. Our time series cuts off in November, but we have learned in these two years that traffic drops over the winter holidays. At least our model has decided that that's probably the case, so that's what it's gonna forecast. Does look like it, uh, it's a little bit it's not hitting any of these extreme points, so there's some, it looks like there's about one per week that exceeds, so there may be some, uh, some, of, some weekly effect that it's, that it's not, uh, not quite strong enough coefficients to capture. So I'm going to very briefly run through what the uh, wrong, let's go with this one, what the exercise had 
again, we were back to the Ecuadorian holidays here, or Ecuadorian store sales. And we have a one new data frame. It's the holidays events and along with our store sales. So I was just looking at the data. What did the holiday data look like? And this is, I think it's being, no, I was just taking a subset from the, from the data to get a feel for what it was. So type, locale, locale name, description, Etc. And then what is the average sales? We have the sales data that's categorized by all these different group groupings. But at the end of this exercise, and for this entire exercise, all we're really interested in is the average. So up here at the top, we're already grouping by date and taking the mean over the store numbers and families. Uh, a few exercises that are pretty similar to the ones we saw before. I won't go through them. One thing I did want to mention here. Let's see. Right, they introduced the concept of de-seasonalizing the series now. So we saw detrending a few minutes ago, and deseasonalizing is the exact same thing for the seasonalized model. All that is is saying is that once you have fit a trend and seasonality to the model, you can subtract that, and hopefully you are left with a model that more closely resembles random noise than it did previously. So we are calculating deseason here. And then looking, well, this is the period periodogram. So the original one showed some pretty strong weekly seasonality for store sales, not surprising. And something, it was interesting here that there was the monthly component was a lot higher than the annual component. Monthly and bi-monthly. So I thought this might be related to uh, paycheck cycles or rent cycles or any of those types of events. And we would look at the time series plotted now deseasonalized. It uh, we don't we don't see any obvious periodicity. We don't really see any obvious trend. There still may be some relationships between adjacent terms, which we'll get into in the in the next unit. And then we go through an exercise down here at the end, which is interesting. We're going to try to see if we can make better predictions by accounting for holidays. So if we look at our original, these are, these are our residuals right now. And the red dots are holidays on the calendar for Ecuador. And we can see that it does look like a lot of the big misses are on holidays. Uh, the new year here, uh, I can't remember beginning of April. Um, the that's a I think that's a regional holiday, Cotopaxi, uh, and then uh, Dia del Trabajo would be uh, Labor Day, the equivalent of Labor Day. Those those look like days where our model really missed. So maybe it'll be helpful to include these as features. So we are a let's see. I was doing some exploration there on, on the opposite side of the code. So we're doing get dummies, which is going to set one hot encoding for holidays. And this is going to have some interesting effects because now we're going to have lots of extra columns. Each one is going to talk about a different holiday. So is it New Year's Day? Then this will be one. Is it uh, Provincialization de Cotopaxi? Then something else down here will be one. Etc. Now you might imagine that this gives the model a lot of flexibility, and a lot of flexibility can be quite counterproductive. So the question there about how to actually code this together, when we look at the results, well, it looks like our model is doing much better. 
it is predicting the New Year's Day, the uh, Cotopaxi holiday, and the Labor Day quite well. But what's really going on here? So I didn't create a separate visualization for this. It wasn't, wasn't emphasized in the course at all, but I, I wanted to filter by holidays and just see, okay, these are the sales amounts on the holidays. And if we were to look at the model's predictions for those holidays, interestingly, the model is predicting exactly the correct answer with a residual, I didn't label these columns either. This is the origin, these are the ground truth. This is model predictions. And this is the residual. And we are hitting every one of these holidays. It is memorizing the data because you are giving the model too much flexibility and you only have have one year and it's just memorizing the value for that one date. Each indicator variable is getting the ability to, to adjust to just a single date. The only reason that we get an exception here is that there are two days that have the same name, Carnival. So interesting little observation. There's also a submit to the store sales competition at the bottom. I didn't go through any of that. I'm guessing that it, just going through this notebook is probably not going to be enough to win me the competition. I submitted this notebook and I think you're like top 300. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Out of how many, George? Uh, this is a intro level competition out of let me see um, out of 300 <laughs> no <laughs> <I don't... laughs> uh, uh, 600 oh, well you're beating half the pack you're better than average okay <laughs> get back to you on the next episode. <laughs> so getting on to unit four, time series as features. Now we are interested in a different phenomenon. What is serial dependence? And he's calling this time series as features and uses the term cycles. I'm more familiar with the language around auto regression because that's really what we're going to be looking at in this notebook we are looking at a time series that does have some sort of patterns and relationships between successive values, but it's neither a trend nor a regular periodicity. So what we're looking at here are two hypothetical time series. And this plot here on the right is what's called a, a lag plot where you're looking at, given the value of the time series at one point, what is the predicted value at the other point? So you put the first point on X, the second point on Y, and it can tell you a little bit about the relationships between adjacent points. A highly autoregressive model, a linear autoregressive model, will show something that looks like linear correlation here, such as this one. This one has a more complicated relationship between successive points. In this notebook, we call them cycles. The concept here is that while there may be some regular, while there may be some patterns, they're not strictly regular. We can't, we can't predict them based on things that we know are going to exist, such as seasons of the year, days of the week, hours of the day. Sunspots are one example they use. The price of orange juice, really the price of any asset is going to be like this. It's going to be pretty highly correlated with whatever you paid for it the previous day. And it's going to change somewhat slowly over time. It's not going to be, it's not going to be white noise. It's going to have some sort of autoregressive tendency to it. I'm not familiar with this data set links and hair. I think it I think it may be a hunting data set number of pelts collected or something and showing the relationship between a predator and prey. 
and unemployment in the United States. So here we're looking at lag plots and if we're going to look at the unemployment rate, let's just say, I don't remember what the time unit is here. I'm going to guess months. So what we're looking at on the x-axis is the unemployment rate in a given month and on the y-axis is the unemployment rate in the following month. And the unemployment rate does not tend to change discontinuously because it only changes when people get hired into or leave jobs. So it will necessarily go up and down on a somewhat gradual scale. So you would expect that there be a high autocorrelation. What we can see here is that yes, there's a high lag one correlation. There are also high lag two, lag three, lag four correlations not because there's anything interesting specific to those lags, but just because you cannot have a high lag one correlation without also having some lag two correlation. If you know that the unemployment rate was 8% three days ago, it's probably still close to 8% or three months ago rather. But the correlation does weaken over time. choosing lags. So now he's going to go into the concept that you're not necessarily going to want to include all of these lags just because each one of them individually looks quite predictive. They are so highly correlated with each other and determined by each other that it's quite possible you could have a model where maybe only the lag one matters and these other ones here only look correlated because, uh, because of lag one. So there's another test you can do, which is called partial autocorrelation. And what that's going to do is measure the correlation of a leg after subtracting out the previous correlation, the, the component from the previous correlation. So you're correcting for it so in a way. So in this case, what we've done is we'll see that the correlation very high for leg one but the corrections are actually negative correlations here. So what does that mean? If with the positive, with the, the very high positive number means that the unemployment rate of one month is likely to be positively related, directly related to the unemployment rate of the previous month. If it was high one month, it's likely to continue to be high. So if that's all we know and it's an auto it's an auto it's an autoregressive series that has no effect from any other lags then we should expect that it will slowly regress to the mean maybe but it will not have any velocity uh memory it, it is a it is a markov process if you will it's only going to look at the current value and the current value is going to be the only thing that matters to the future value. If we have a positive or negative partial, partial autocorrelation for the second unit, then that is going to tell us that not only does the current value matter, but something about the direction that it was going currently also matters. So if you're, if you're up here and it's partial autocorrelation is still positive here, then that means that you're uh, moving in the positive direction. And down here, <clears throat> down here, you may be moving in the negative direction. And this third autocorrelation could correspond to some measurement of an acceleration. And various order derivatives as you go down. So you can imagine that for many processes, you really don't want to keep too many uh, autocorrelation coefficients. I'm actually going to share an, a much more detailed blog post that I found years ago when I was trying to learn a lot of this stuff, or play with it rather. I think I had learned it in R and was trying to figure out how to code a lot of these methods in Python. And this was the point when I was first introduced to stat models, stats models. But this uh, 
this uh, blog post here, which I'll throw in the chat, I found super informative about how to really use lots of different time series methods in Python. They go into far more detail than we could ever hope to do tonight. Um, stuff like Arima, um, Arch models, Garch, but, but he also covers the very basics very thoroughly as well. A lot of really great stuff here for, for, for anyone really at all levels you'll find something interesting in this blog post. He's got some good visualizations here of autocorrelation and partial autocorrelation. I, when I was trying to learn this stuff in stats models, I also uh, created my own notebook and started messing with some of this stuff too. And borrowed some of his visualizations and started simulating time series. I can throw the GitHub link to that in the chat as well. Um, this was more, wasn't really intended for um, blog posts necessarily, but it's got some material that goes in a little bit different direction than the uh, Black Arbs post. Thank you, Robert. Robert, quick question Dimitri has, which I also am thinking about. In that periodogram that you showed before in the previous tab, where lag one had a high magnitude, almost close to one, um, does that mean that it's uh, that two values, two neighboring values are basically the same, like they're highly correlated? Are they perfectly correlated or just very highly, like 0.99 or one? So the, he, so Dimitri is saying this partial autocorrelation function is strange because lag one seems to be perfectly correlated to current. So it is, it is a little bit below one. Um, we're looking at this series here. 0.99, right? Yeah. And, and the takeaway here is that if you plotted the autocorrelation function, this one on the left, which I don't have an example in this notebook of a highly autocorrelated function, but you would see you would see long spikes for every one of these things because you'd have 0 0.99, 0 0.98, 0 0.97, 0 0.96, and then you would distinguish that from um, only lag lag one being the only important one. You'd have to look at the partial autocorrelation function, which is the reason for this one. So just for me to understand this this correlation numbers that you see, right? 0 0.99, 0 0.98, 0 0.97, 0 0.95. Do they have any Significance are they related at all to the paradogram? Are they related at all to the periodogram? Yeah, like I said, you see the smooth transition, right? From highly correlated, like one to like less correlated, less, but there's a smooth transition versus periodogram is just jumped from one to like negative, negative point two. Yeah, so there's a complicated relationship between the periodogram and the lags for for an autoregressively generated series. The if you have a series with correlation lag one of 0.99, what that means is that learning the current value tells you a lot about the next value. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have a slowly varying time series that is still, we'll assume it's stationary, which is another term from time series language, but it basically means that it's not drifting, drifting anywhere. It has some mean that it returns to over time. If you have high correlated series like this, then you tend to have longer, higher, higher period, uh, lower frequency components in the period periodogram. It's long but the purpose for doing this analysis here is to not constrain yourself to regular periodicity. Rather um, than being rather than a point of value being determined by the day of the month or the day of the week, it's determined by the previous value. Robert, a question. Do they have a code snippet that generated the uh, PACF? Uh, for this one? 
Yeah, the down there. Uh, yeah, for for this one. Yeah. No, no, for uh, partial uh, correlation plot. The. Uh, yeah. For, for these correlation plots. No, the above. Uh, just yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I sure. don't remember. There's probably one at the bottom. Okay. It's probably a helper function down here. There's actually a module. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, there's a there's a module they import. They don't. They don't code it from scratch, Dimitri. Okay. So just uh, um, my my uh, GitHub notebook does have a version that codes it from scratch. StatsHub has or Stats models has a version, but I think it's I think it's in here under. Yeah. It's, it's just uh, my couple cents. So typically, when you use uh, ACF PACF, uh, it shows zero, like it shows one, a perfect correlation with itself, and then it goes down from there. Or you know, it, you know, can, can have different uh, structures. This one doesn't have the the, the one attached so that's why i thought maybe you know they had the indices you know wrong or something so this uh the, the so, one so, so uh, what's interesting here I, I, maybe you're talking about that that usually when a plot a uh, autocorrelation you include the lag zero term yes yeah yeah th this one's not doing that they, they removed it like ordinarily you'd see a lag zero term at exactly one yeah. And then you'd have everything else to compare it to. Yeah. However, obviously at lag zero, you're always going to get one. So that information isn't terribly useful. Right. It just, uh, the uh, previous uh, unemployment reading uh, seems to be like perfectly correlated with, uh, with the current one. And if that would be the case, then, you know, uh, I mean, that, that's not the case. Just let's, let's start with that. So, uh, it just you know they're not perfectly correlated, and uh, uh, I was thinking maybe if they have the source code, we could look and, and see what's happened. But uh, oh, the source code for how they're generating those series? yeah the plot yeah and, no no the, the yeah. plot the the plot itself. Uh there may be something in here. I I don't recall. It's flu trends, flu visits. So you may be able to just get that data set. Plot PACF that's borrowed from uh, one of these yes, libraries. So at the very top, there's an option you can copy and edit this notebook and you can take a closer look. But yeah, if I remember. This is where they got plot PACF. Yeah. yeah. And plot PACF uh, does uh, plot you the uh, zeros, uh, the, z the, the correlation with itself, uh, I think, always. So. This is something strange. Uh, anyway, let's uh, not spend time in that. Yeah, I, I actually, because I was learning it using this other notebook, I've always found this kind of visualization super useful, right? This uh, this guy from Black Arbs defined this helper function here that produces this sort of analysis grid for every time series. <laughs> it's just a super easy way to see what's going on. We can look at the code in the end, if you want. So I, th I think we're, let's see, are there, are there other questions now or should we move on? I guess it looks like the chat's empty. So I think we were at choosing lags. And here the concept is that even though you have these high correlations, it's just like linear regression. If you have a lot of correlated variables, it may not be useful to include them all in the regression. Similar concept here, where if we have great information from lag one and lag two doesn't tell us anything new, then we actually don't want to include it as a regression variable, even though it shows a high correlation with the target. I was also uh, a while ago interested in this 95% confidence interval, so did a little bit of experimentation with uh, statistical testing over here in this uh, notebook on my GitHub as well. As uh, so Leung Box is the test that's usually used to determine if the terms in the partial autocorrelation function are statistically significant or not.
So what we'd like to do is apply these concepts to another data set. And now we're looking at the flu trends data set, records of doctor, <clears throat> doctor's visits for flu for weeks between 2009, 2016, seven years. And we start out as usual with a bunch of helper functions. He's going to define much of the visualization that you've seen above the lag plot, another function called plot lags. And now we're going to read the data set, flu trends, set it to weekly frequency, and then drop the week column once we've put it as the index. And this is a candidate for an autoregressive type model because although there is some semblance of annual seasonality, it's hard to predict when the peak will occur within the winter season. Incidentally, I would probably recommend modeling this type of data with some kind of transformation first. If you're going to if you're going to apply a linear regression model to a uh, disease spread data like this, um, typically uh, where the spread is exponential, you might want to take a log transform of the data, which is going to make it much more well behaved for a linear regression model. Uh, or you could do a more general uh, box cox transformation to get the data so they look a little bit less skewed. Right now, if you looked at the data, it's highly right skewed. And you can see that skew in our lag plots as well, where we do all right for lag one, lag, but then as the lag gets bigger and bigger, the errors become very unevenly distributed. And we have lots of really high residuals all here in the, uh, in the larger lags. Partial autocorrelation. Now we do seem to have the zero plotted. Interesting. The lag plots indicate that the relationship is mostly linear. And the partial autocorrelations, they're going to keep termed 1, 2, 3, and 4. So as we said, the partial autocorrelation, what that's really doing is it's keeping terms about the velocity, the acceleration, etc those types of measurements of the number of cases. So this is important because if we're here in 2013 and you know our current value is at where I'm pointing and we're over here on the other side of this hump, we want to know which direction we're going, up or down. So it's important to keep those extra terms because the current level doesn't really tell us the full story about the trend. So we know we're going to need a couple of extra terms. Here we're keeping four, which is kind of the equivalent of using a fourth order uh, polynomial to, to fit it. Another helper function here for making the lags. And now we're going to look at the fit itself. And again, I think this visualization is probably not the not the easiest one to see what's going on because you can miss the data points quite a bit and still look pretty good because of the aspect ratio at the peaks. But zooming in now we do get a better view. And one thing that's worth noting here is that our method can do reasonably well at figuring out whether we're trending up or trending down, but it can't anticipate the turnaround. So it's always about a step behind. So it's under predicting while we're on the way up, and it tends to over predict while we're on the way down.
Ryan then goes on to bring in another term in hopes of improving the model. So if we have the search phrase flu cough, maybe this is looking at internet searches, I think, where he's just saying if we're looking add internet searches to our data and does that help us make better predictions about visits? So this is just visualizing the data. These are not predictions. Flu cough search, flu visits. I don't draw any huge conclusions from this plot. It does look like searches go up in the fall every year, well before the cases actually go up. So maybe searches being much higher than cases is some kind of indicator, but then on the way back down, it looks like searches tend to still be higher than cases. And this is the result of the fit. I'd say a little bit, a little bit better. Definitely staying a little bit closer to the lines. I don't remember if that was the same, yeah, it's the same peak that we looked at before. So we've uh, we, we've hit the the uh, nine o'clock mark uh, right. here on the east coast. Um, <laughs> there's there's nothing really new in the the exercise. Again, we're looking at uh, the Ecuadorian store sales. There, for those who are actually working through this, I believe there's a bug in one of these exercises which we should note. The fourth one. I think the, the code is looking for three features here, but the way that it's looking for the features, it actually, you end up getting two that are identical. Yeah, uh, otherwise I thought it was pretty uh pretty much just followed the the material. We also got to do some more practice with pandas uh, window methods rolling. Right. So I think you made the lags on your own versus uh you can also call the helper functions in for make call the what the helper functions you have some helper functions to make lag or make lead yeah there you oh go. you're right yeah i did not call them i think i did them through this on promotion shift right you can yeah i mean but it could be that the bug is mine i but i did end up i did end up passing the exercise with this code here that that oil threw me off like crazy. Like, what is the oil? <laughs> uh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. This is not even used, right? I know. <laughs> I don't know what that is. That is that meant as oil to like lubricate the data so that two data sets can be concatenated easier? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not defined anywhere. <laughs> it's just it's an not defined anywhere in the notebook. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah. Okay. Um... Also, some sometimes the comments, but the actual code don't match. Like they say, twenty-eight day mean, but actually you need seven day mean. <laughs> um, yeah, and a little little typos. That's okay. Little, little typos, but but uh, otherwise, I think the exercises were pretty uh, pretty on point as far as cool. giving you practice with the with the material. Cool. Thank you, Robert. This was a very interesting session. Thank you for sharing your uh, exploration with us, the notebook on GitHub, as well as the, the website that you mentioned. Cool. Thank you, friends. This was a lot of information. Uh, and I'm glad we broke it into two parts because it was such a long one. Um, I'm going to wrap up quickly just to um, 
share with us what is coming up next week. And yeah, and for those of you who joined us throughout the session, this is recorded and I'll post it tomorrow. Okay, so we covered the first four sessions here. Um, next week, uh, we'll cover um, number five and number six, um, as well as some new cool or additional visualization, additional modules and packages. So we'll cover at a very high level um, Facebook's or Meta's profit. Um, this package called Rocket and Mini Rocket, which are based on um, papers, as well as a, just a very higher level overview of this M5 forecasting competition, maybe maybe some um, solutions that were submitted. Um, again, we won't have the time to go through them in detail, so I included, included links here for you to go through it, but yeah, tomorrow we'll talk about hybrid, or next week, sorry, not tomorrow, uh, about hybrid models as well as using ML techniques. Um, that is coming up next week. Um, that is part two. And then I want to um, preface a little bit. So let, let me take us back to our um, calendar. Um, so after that, we're going to switch gears. Uh, Dimitri is going to do a third session on attention transformers in December. It's going to talk to us, uh, talk to us about this Kaggle competition on uh, education-related content. Looking forward to that. And then we're going to switch gears completely. We're going to start a new adventure. Um, we're going to talk about AWS certifications and uh, sometime early next year about Google Cloud Platform certification as well. So we're going to start with uh, the practitioner just to get a basic understanding uh, of the different services, the different terminology, and um, how that is used. The goal is not the entry level, the goal is this um, machine learning here. So we're just using this cloud practitioner just to familiarize ourselves with the terminology. Uh, for many of us who actually use AWS, this might, might, may, might not be necessary, but uh, for, for, you, for you who don't use AWS on a day-to-day -day basis, it's a good idea to, to take this. Uh, you, you don't have to take the exam, you can just take the training material and then we can jump here directly, which is the goal. Uh, we're going to follow the same approach also for Google Cloud. We're going to do the entry level one. There's a, a cloud associate uh, special uh, certification, and then there's a machine learning as well. I'm not, I don't use Microsoft products in my job. So if anybody would like to volunteer to do the same thing for Azure, that'd be great, or maybe other cloud providers, like an entry level discussion, and then maybe uh, how does their AI services look like? So we have like a multi-cloud um, overview, that'd be great. But that's what we have coming up. Um, and yeah, we're gonna take a break for Thanksgiving and yeah, we'll come back uh, with even more adventures. So with that said, I'm gonna stop recording here. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thanks for the great, thank you for the great discussions. Um, I'll post the recording tomorrow and yeah, I'll leave the follow over and if anybody wants to chat. If you're joining us from YouTube, thanks again. And uh, please feel free to, to either join us or post your comments on, on YouTube. Thank you.